Hello and welcome. My name is Natasha Bernal. I'm the Deputy Tech Editor at the FT. For those of you who are joining us right now, welcome. This is a live panel and we would like to hear your questions. If you would like to ask our panellists anything, please write in the box to your right. You can also take part in the discussion on social media by using the hashtag FTETNO. So let's start. Welcome to the panel on the state of Europe's digital infrastructure challenge. Now we've seen the public and private sectors joining forces to enable rollouts of 5G, fibre and data centres. But could private companies and regulators do more to speed it up? To speak about this topic, I'm delighted to welcome Alexandra Philippe Fonseca, who is the CEO of telecommunications company Altice Portugal, Anne-Marie Sipkis, who is the Bar who's Barrick's 2022 Chair and Director at the Netherlands Authority for Consumer and Markets, and Philippe Banu, who is Executive Vice President at Infrastructure Connectivity Company, the Prismian Group. Welcome everyone, hello. Hello. Hi, hi, hello. Um, I would like to just dive in uh, really quickly, perhaps starting with Alexandra, I'm sorry to put you on the spot straight away, but I'd like to get a sense of the outlook from a business perspective on how the rollout has been going. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you again. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me once again to this uh, to this event. Well, going straight to uh, what is the current situation and outlook for Portugal, of course, as you might remember, Portugal was, uh, ex I would say, especially well positioned in what regards to optical fiber deployments. It still is the case, of course, in the case of Altis Portugal, which is the, the former incumbent and the number one operator, we've just crossed the line of six million households covered with optical fiber from a total of six and a half million. So we're talking about 90% coverage of the total population already served with optical fiber services. This has been made essentially through the private investment of companies such as Altis and of course our competitors as well, um, but it's been driven, all this infrastructure deployment has been driven by the will and the, and the, the strategy that we've out, outlined um, to make sure that the fiber rollout would be not only a way to increase the digital reach for companies and families, but also to leapfrog the situations that happen in other European countries with the next generation of uh, copper services like V, DSL and others, which we leapfrogged in Portugal and we don't use it, uh, we've never used it to be, to be honest. So the situation in Portugal has been, uh, has been quite, I would say, quite well established in what regards to optical fiber deployment. And in terms of regulation on the fix, regulation because it was previously to the existing uh, board of directors of the, the regulator. Um, it used to be, I would say, a very a, a cooperation between the two, between the private companies and the regulator to make sure, number one, that the HFC networks and the fiber networks were rolled out in a good pace, that, mm -hmm. that the reach of those optical fiber networks was available to everybody. And Anacom, our regulator, understood this in the past. Well, to be honest, it, it changed a lot. It changed a lot in 2017 with the existing board of directors of Anacom and at the same time with the initial steps towards 5G. If on optical fiber we were leaders, uh, European leaders, I would say, because there's not there's not a lot of countries with over 90% of coverage, uh, household and population coverage with optical fiber, and, and this has been the case for quite some time, in 5G was exactly the opposite. In 5G, we were the last the last country in Europe to have the 5G auction uh, finalized, which just happened one month ago, less than one month ago. Yeah. It happened because the regulator has put uh, uh, an auction process in place, which was number one, was not in line with the government strategy and the one that we believe was the most adequate for such an important task like deploying 5G. Well, more than my words, the truth is that after 200 days of auction, 1,700 uh, rounds of bidding. Um, that's only when we were finally over with the bidding process, which led us uh, to be uh, almost the last country in Europe to have 5G. And as we speak, um, we are just finalizing the administrative process of handing over the licenses so that we can start operating in Portugal, which is, of course, a huge disaster for the economy and also for the technology leaders that we used to be. It's also important to say that besides the time it took 
and the delays, the significant delays we have in 5G, which will have impact for companies and for the economy. It's also important to say that it's been a very troubled process, troubled with the legal lawsuits undergoing still both in national courts, but also appeals to the European Commission, essentially because of what we consider to be state aids. State aids because the new entrants, um, they had a specific auction just for new entrants, they have specific pricing conditions for new entrants, different covered obligation for new entrants, and this, in our view, it's not the way we increase competition, because what happens is that we are uh, scaling up prices, we are creating artificial barriers for the MNOs, the existing MNOs, and this will be, of course, a situation that will reduce the capabilities to do investments, and by doing that, leading to price increases, uh, to threats on employment, etc., in such an important sector like our own. So, yeah. I just just to finalize, just to tell you that I've been uh, publicly stating for the last two years in a row that I believe that co-investment between this private sector and the public sector, essentially to get to white spot areas where not fiber, optical fiber or 5G or even 4G in some cases don't exist. This is the way to go forward. Uh, unfortunately, it's not yet the case in Portugal, but I hope looking forward, this will be the case of this cooperation and co-investment between the private and the public sector. Yeah, so clearly some very mixed opinions about uh, the rollout of fibre versus 5G. Obviously a bit of a disaster, it seems, that 5G has been in your experience. Uh, but from your perspective, and I, I suppose I'm looking for, for Philippe to come in here, because again, uh, you, you do a lot of infrastructure side of things. I know that you have both energy and fibre going through your pipes. I'm keen to get a sense as to whether you also um, have had the similar experience, Alexandra, but on, on a wider scale uh, across Europe, or whether you've had better fortune, perhaps, outside of Portugal. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, uh, we do, you know, we, we make the products mm -hmm. for Alexander to build his network. And, and we, we do that uh, worldwide. So we see, from my seat, I can see the different practices in different regions and countries. Uh, I, I would not necessarily uh, oppose um, fiber to the home and 5G, because in any case, all these technologies in any case need fiber. We need fiber to the antenna to enable 5G to be a real 5G in any case. So I think the countries like Portugal that have really taken the lead in rolling out a very high density fiber network will get a payback also on the 5G side afterwards when they have settled their way of uh, doing the spectrum and 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 the, the possible litigations that they have locally so i think it's still a real asset for portugal to be to be ahead uh, when i look at europe compared to other regions um, i would not necessarily say that europe is lagging behind in, in general uh, the point with Europe is that, uh, as always, Europe is extremely fragmented. And you, ha you have countries like Portugal and Spain, to, uh, who, who they took the lead very early. You have countries catching up like uh, France, Romania, uh, the northern countries that are really getting close now to the same level of uh, Iberia, I would say. And then you have other countries lagging behind because they, they, they made different choices, as Alessandro was saying. They, they decided to go on a step-by-step -step basis. And of course, this, uh, it's probably in, in a certain way better for the short-term optimization of your capex, but it takes long time, yeah. a lo much longer time. And also it's not necessarily the right way from the, from the sustainability perspective. Mm -hmm. because you do things, uh, you have more works to do uh, after all. So I, I think the point here I see clearly, and this is true absolutely everywhere, there are still two challenges to, to manage globally that are first the rural areas that are uh, still very much lagging behind in nearly all the countries. This is a very specific item to be addressed because usually there is no payback for who is investing as an operator. So it has to be organized with public right. inevitably. And second, 
uh, the high density areas, take the example of um, London, for instance, mm -hmm. are extremely congested and they need for, there is a need for more density of, uh, of network of fiber in these already congested areas. So these are the two kind of issues that, that we have to tackle in the coming years. And I very much agree to say that uh, in, in, although it's not necessarily my interest as a vendor, I, <laughs> I think uh, as a citizen, the right way is to co-invest and mm -hmm. to find ways to do things together. If not, it will be, it will not be optimized in the end for 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 many aspects from many, many perspectives. The, the 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 performance of the network, mm -hmm. second also the sustainability of that network. So I believe I believe in making it in the right way with with high quality components and high quality solutions using the best available technology immediately. And if the way to the enabler for doing this is to do it together, we should do it together. That's yeah. my personal opinion. So let me draw, draw on what you both have said and get Anne-Marie in on this and see what your thoughts are. So we, we've heard from Philippe, extremely fragmented, from Alexandra, costly. Now, this, these are two sentences, these are two qualifiers that don't exactly speak volumes. And I know you have your frustration about the, the rollout and the speed of the rollout as well from the perspective of, of a legislator. So I'm keen to get your sense on, on how things are going and then perhaps see if you agree with Philippe that the solution is co to co-invest and to push things forward faster, but with technology that will be more durable. Thank you, Natasha. Well, from a regulator's um, perspective, of course, we're all striving towards meaningful end-to-end -end connectivity. And meaningful end-to-end -end connectivity means that people and businesses can have fast, reliable, and affordable internet connections that help enable the, trans the digital transformation that we're looking for. Um, and there are various parts of this, uh, of this connectivity puzzle. Um, and to immediately jump to the point of um, uh, of cooperation or co-invest. Let, let me point out that the European Electronic Communication Code that is almost is going to be transposed into national legislation next beginning of next year, and that's a year late. It's not on me as a regulator or as barrack on regulators. It is a national, uh, all national governments have had trouble with transposing that. But the code actually puts those two interests of the end users as well as the investment uh, strictly together and, and gets, gets more flexibility uh, for, for example, co-investment. But let's just get it into concrete examples. Where do we actually uh, do enable, uh, of course, this um, uh, transformation into uh, uh, high connectivity? Uh, well, to start with the white spots that, that uh, both Philippe and Alexandra have been uh, referring to, um, of course, we, um, uh, Barrick has been mapping a broadband rollout throughout Europe for years now. And I think that the data that we have collected makes sure that if we, uh, uh, that if state aid is given, that we are sure that, that the, the proper white spots are being uh, targeted without unduly frustrating uh, market dynamics. So I think this is one, as Philippe said, the rural areas, the true rural areas where there's no business case and you do want state aid is something that I think Barrick has already made sure that all the data are there so that we can see which regions are really the, the trouble spots yeah. without, again, frustrating uh, investment opportunities. Um, and we will also be commenting on the new state aid guidelines that the Commission has just uh, put up for co public consultation. On the other hand, um, I really uh, like, and I agree with Philippe, that, that the change from copper to fiber is also good news in, in terms of sustainability. And I think that has been discussed today. And I do also think at Barrick, we are trying, we are um, making sure that we try to uh, underpin the trend, the migration from copper to fiber in a, in a consistent way. And the report that we're, pre that we're, that we're preparing um, uh, right now shows that there's a huge variety throughout Europe. In some countries, almost half uh, of the copper MDFs have already been, uh, been taken out of business. Other countries are just starting, but the majority of the national regulators are actually already having policies in place to make sure that the, that the migration from copper to fiber goes in an orderly fashion and to make sure that that goes as smoothly as possible 
without, without creating, again, undue damage. So I think that as regulators, we are very conscious of the, of the phase that we're in, trying to, to, uh, to uh, um, increase uh, connectivity to the technological innovation is going at a tremendous pace and the societal needs are changing as well. So we have to balance, on the one hand, the stable regulatory environment, so that everybody knows the rules of the game and the rules of the market. We keep um, open fair markets, as Margaret Verstager has pointed out today, earlier today. Um, on the one hand, and also uh, accommodating the, the changing needs that we, we see given the pace of innovation on the one hand and societal needs on the other, because we do have to do this in a sustainable way. We have to do this uh, also, um, for example, keeping the trust of all the people um, uh, involved and our end users. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to touch upon that a little bit more because you, you mentioned the sort of pace of, of innovation um, earlier on. And, and I know I know you've said previously to me that COVID has, has played a part in, in all of this, right? The pandemic has slowed things down. And I, I wonder, you know, Alexandra was mentioning earlier the, the costliness of things. And it's, it's I wonder what, in your from your perspective, what has the cost of the pandemic signified for this rollout? How much has it delayed things and how much of a problem has it been? Because we're now seeing a new variant emerge, which is why we're sitting in our respective offices rather than together on a stage. So this is obviously uh, potentially far from over. Uh, and I, I wonder how that will impact from, from your view um, that the rollout in the coming months. Well, I think there it varies, I think, from, from, from country to country. For example, in the Netherlands, where I have the most, um, uh, of course, the, the most uh, um, recent data, is um, we were really afraid that the rollout of fiber in the Netherlands would slow down because of uh, a, a, a building capacity. But fortunately, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. um, actually, because people are seeing the, um, uh, the use cases for, for the digital connectivity um, uh, every day. I think uh, people have, uh, for example, not been afraid to, to literally open up their front door and have the fiber installed into their houses. So, yeah. so this is, it, it is both a, both a, both a chance and, um, uh, and a drawback, but because the one, the one word that I haven't heard today yet was the digital divide. I think that the, that the lockdown has, has actually underlined the importance of connectivity for all, for small businesses, for people in rural areas, as, as has been already pointed out. Um, and sometimes you don't need fiber, you need 5G. So, you, so we, need, we need all the high capacity networks that are available given the geographical specificities throughout Europe. Um, so I, I, I think it actually has, um, has uh, proved that, that the pandemic and the lockdowns that we've had in various degrees has increased the business case and increased the importance of, uh, of what I said, meaningful uh, meaningful end-to-end -end connectivity. It has also shown the risk of not being able to provide access to people and businesses alike. Um, so this is why I think, and, and it, it has the risk of, of, of um, enlarging the digital divide, which I think for Europe would be, would be a waste, would be tremendous. Mm -hmm. And I suppose in a country like Portugal, to bring, to bring you back in, Alexandra, a, a country like Portugal that doesn't have that copper infrastructure to fall back on, perhaps would have hoped that 5G would swoop in. I can imagine a lot of people were relying on, on 4G through, through the pandemic. I, I'm not sure what the scenario was, but how difficult was it for people to, to do business at, from home during the pandemic? And, and, and has that sped up matters internally for, 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 in terms of the infrastructure investment um, from companies that are wanting to push this forward and say, we need to provide this, this um, access to, to the internet because otherwise it's gonna be a big problem if we're not able to sort this soon. Oh, it's, it's important to understand that, as I mentioned before, when the pandemic crisis started, we were already cruising roughly close to 5 million households in Portugal already served with optical fiber. So it's true that Portugal was a country, I saw some reports from other countries in Europe. In Portugal, I can say without any, any risk that throughout this one and a half to two years of pandemic crisis, there is no news about blackouts or situations of no connectivity, especially from people that were connected with fiber. It's true that people still with HDS, ADSL or with HFC networks have struggled a little bit, but people connected with fiber, and in our case, most, most of our customers, over 50% of our customer base is already on fiber. People, families were able to go home, study, work, connect, 
uh, use content. Uh, even the, the plain vanilla fixed phone was back online. Uh, we saw increases of 80% of usage of the plain fixed phone. So I do believe that Portugal was very well prepared to address uh, this because of the investments that Altice Portugal has had since 2016 when we started this rollover, this, this rollout of optical fiber. So this is more than just words, it's the proof that in fact, uh, optical fiber connections are not only the future in terms of communications, but essentially also they can cope very easily with tremendous increase, tremendous increases of usage uh, and consumption of internet, TV, over the top services, etc. Now, I would just like to highlight something that Anne Marie said because it's it's very important, especially mm -hmm. coming from regulators. And we do believe in regulation. Number one, I've been putting my my pressure on the regulator, but I'm I'm a I'm a fan of regulation of good regulation, uh, and we've been supporting regulation in the past, uh, essentially because regulation brings us two things, two words that I marie put on the table, which for me are crucial, stability and predictability. That's clearly the way regulators should look to the work of regulating um, the, the, the spaces and the sectors where they operate. And this is something that in the past has been working very nicely in Portugal. And a good example is that from my own network, optical fiber network, the network is open. Uh, access to pools and to ducks is regulated in Portugal for over 50 years. So uh, vertical networks within buildings are regulated and they work. So all the regulation that has been put in place to allow access to physical infrastructures like pools or ducts to vertical networks and even the opening the networks, the optical fiber networks that we have uh, commercial offers on the table for everybody to use, even new entrants if they want to use our optical fiber networks, this is very important. The problem is like it happened in 5G, when we cross the line where regulators start to hit tremendously the sector. They start to create uh, artificial barriers for existing operators to pave the way for new entrants. Portugal is 10 million inhabitants, 4 million households, 6.5 million homes, and we have three operators on fix and four operators, uh, sorry, three operators on mobile and four operators on fix. And our regulator has made a crusade for the last three to four years that we need to have two more uh, mobile operators, creating the way for us to now have five mobile operators in a couple of months, I'm, I'm sure. And even besides paving the way, creating uh, artificial ways for them to have uh, the ability to invest less and to use the networks that we have been implementing and investing severely for the last 30 years. It's three decades of investment that will now be put almost at zero cost uh, at uh, the disposal of the new entrants, which by the way, in the 5G auction have invested 30% of what the MNOs have invested. So this is the way I do believe we need to rethink some of the regulators' powers within the countries because I'm a fan of regulation, I insist. I do believe that regulation has, has, has had a tremendous path in the leadership that Portugal has in the fixed networks, but in the mobile, in this case of 5G, and essentially because the change of leadership in the board of Anacom of our regulator has drawn to waste a big part of the work that has been done and essentially has taken out trust, has taken out predictability, has taken out stability. And with this, this is where things start to be very concerning because it's not just the delays in 5G, because in fact, we can live with the delays in 5G. We can live because we've invested severely on 4G. We have yeah. almost 100% of the country in fiber, but 5G is very important for businesses. It's very important for next generation services for companies. It's very important to, do, to, the, to the digital transformation of the society. And we've been lagging. We've been lagging that because only because of personal views and assumptions from regulators, which could not happen and should not happen. So I do believe that now we want to look forward. We want to roll out 5G. We have probably one of the most demanding coverage obligations set on the table because for MNOs, our regulator has put them on the table, mm -hmm. not for the new entrants, which have almost zero coverage obligations. So this is the asymmetry that I was talking about, but yeah. I'm sure that 5G will be a reality and it has its spot. As Philippe said, 5G is only possible now to catch up a little bit of the lost time because uh, from our antennas, from our mobile sites, over 90% of
90% of them are already covered with fiber. So this yeah. is the importance of fiber as the backhaul of 5G. But again, for 5G to be a success business-wise, it's important to be rolled out on time, but it's essentially to be a balanced market because otherwise, if we put all the money in the auctions and to buy Spectrum, there's no money left to invest in the creation of the networks, in the deployment of the services, and by the end of the day, what this uh, unpredictability that we are feeling in Portugal because of the regulations, power and position on 5G, it's just creating the risk of non-investment, getting the investment in the new services, putting uh, putting jobs on the table, um, and this is creating a very, I would say, not investment-friendly environment in Portugal, which has not been the case. And this is a situation which is very tricky for this digital transformation that the country needs to do, uh, like all the countries in Europe. I feel the frustration in your voice. I can sense, <laughs> I can sense how, how, how passionately you feel about this. I, I, I wonder, from, from, I, I don't want to like pass the, the hot potato to you, but Anne-Marie, I kind of am going to, because I, I do want to know from the perspective of regulators, because all, all these things are at play. A lot of the things Alexandra's just said remind me of the complaints that have been happening across the UK um, and, and elsewhere with companies saying, wait a second, uh, why, why are Spectrum Auctions opening up? Things for competition when I'm creating all the infrastructure, how is this fair, etc. And I, I do wonder from, from a regulator perspective, um, obviously your objective is, as you said before, to make sure that all, including rural areas of the country, it, are, are covered, rural areas and not, you know, investment opportunities, they're not seen as very, you know, commercially viable, someone has to do it, everyone should have right to connectivity, and that's your priority. But in terms of dealing with, with um, especially players like Altice that, that might consider that it's unfair, how are regulators responding to that now, and what, what kind of things are they saying to, to, to make a, more of a level playing field and saying, okay, if we understand we want more competition, more competition will, is always good um, <laughs> in, in many markets, but is does it make sense in this scenario? What's what's your perspective, Anne Marie? Well, without being obviously, I have I have not the knowledge that Alexandra does of the, of the Portuguese market. Let's just say at Barrick what we are doing. Yeah. Um, um, auctions and spectrum auctions like these, as as are all um, regulatory choices that one has to make, are about balancing uh, a lot of the aspects that Alexandra also mentioned. You want rollout, you want investment, you want clear business cases, but especially you want um, you want to stimulate or guarantee uh, a market dynamics that is going to enable to to make sure that the society can reap the fruits of all of that. And that is balancing a whole lot of parameters at the same time, um, knowing that you try to do that um, in a, to create, a, as I said, a stable regulatory environment while the whole world is changing. So the thing that you cannot keep stable is just the, the simple outcome of parameters. So what you do is you try to, as we do in the guidelines, and these are built upon, of course, the, our, our European, uh, the European framework. And then we, we, we formulate the principles in our guidelines as to how are we looking, what do we, what do we look at if we look at the market dynamics, what do we think is important, um, what are factors that we take into account. And I think that one of the things on, on Exanta regulation is we're trying to make, as it were, the crash barriers for the, for the market dynamics. And we try to do that always in a very open uh, process of, of consultation of the various stakeholders. Um, and then sometimes, um, and, and you cannot satisfy all of them. This is, this is rigged with dilemmas, of course. Um, and what at Beric we try to do is to get, to get the principles right, to make sure that we have, as Europe, um, a, 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 a unified approach, as much unified as is wise, given the fact that we all have different starting points, different geographies, different incumbents, different histories, different everything. As Alexandra said, Portugal needed to leapfrog. Other countries have a different starting point. So you need to accommodate those differences, try to um, harmonize as much as you can, do that through a principled uh, base, and then get your data straight. Uh, make sure, and this is what we do uh, within Barrick. we exchange practices um, on the, and, and we try to see what are the best practices, how are we going to address this to make sure that we do we do it in a, we approach it in a similar vein um, and try to, um, to to help the European single market. And then the outcomes are sometimes, of course, the interests are huge. 
Um, and the outcomes are sometimes very frustrating for uh, particular uh, particular parties. I understand that. It's, um, yeah, it's not just uh, businesses that you have to sort of persuade, right? Um, I know this. Exactly. Some sometimes towards... it's local governments, for example, yeah. um, that you have that that that, that are that are. are um, um, and for good reason sometimes, because they have populations that are very worrying. Um, there's, there's so much interest at stake, which is actually why I really like to be a regulator, because it's rigged with dilemmas and puzzles. And you, you are trying to help society to take a next step. But as I said, it's a balancing, it's a balancing act. And we try to, through extensive processes of data gathering and consultation, to make sure that you get a proper mix, which works now and works uh, for the future. Um, um, uh, and that's actually how we are trying at Barrack to to help each other to get it right. Do you think that some of the pressures um, that, that have been put on, especially the rollout of 5G um, with sort of cybersecurity concerns and societal concerns of you know, health and, you know, the, the, the impact of 5G on the ground, do you think those problems have been solved, Emery? Um, well, solved is a big, is a big, these are dilemmas, so they're like eternally with us, so they will pop up. But I do think... Um, I hope that, that I, I think, for example, on the health and, and security issues, I do think that within Europe, we have made tremendous steps forward in really, ex um, in really exchanging uh, data, knowledge, research, uh, for example, from the WHO, um, and making sure that we're all on the same page, that we're all saying, okay, this is what we say, this knowledge, if people have questions, then we should answer them. Um, make sure that there's uh, no misunderstanding, uh, no fake news on what is really going on. And then again, making consistent frameworks and have a, having a consistently um, the same research science-based approach to, um, to a lot of the questions that are out there at some point. Yeah, I, I wanted to move to, to Philippe because I know that obviously with, with every infrastructure project, there is a potential target, right? So I, I wonder, have you had to grapple with any kind of cybersecurity issues or in fact, any problems uh, trying to trying to just basically set down the infrastructure and, and the cableage that you need to do yeah. across across your network? <coughs> cableage, yes. Cableage, yeah, no, a horrible word. That you didn't know, I have to say, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, uh, my concern is that one thing I think we shouldn't forget is that we are talking about building a global infrastructure for our countries. Mm -hmm. And it's an infrastructure that is supposed to, that is meant to, to cope with waves of new technologies that are coming towards us and that we don't even know yet. I mean, it's like building the basement of a building without having the drawing of the building. Yeah. Because in, ter in, in, in ITC, it's like this, you know, you see new things coming that were not existing five years before, and we all go for it. And, I, and, and our infrastructure is meant to support that. And when you lay down a cable or an optical fiber, it's for 30 years. So if you don't go immediately for future-proof solutions, uh, sooner or later, you will have to reinvest or you will have to pay for a very high maintenance uh, operative cost, one of the two. I think what is very important, I believe, is to uh, keep that in mind and make the right choices now because the decision makers of today have the responsibility of the performance of the network mm -hmm. and of the cost of the network for the next 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, now that there are, there is, a lot of money available, public money available uh, in the recovery plans. We have a certain deadline to use the money. Mm -hmm. My fear uh, as, a, as an engineer, but also as a citizen, is that we would spend that money in a quick and dirty way yeah. just to have it done uh, after we have got the money available. I'm, I'm far more inclined to say, uh, uh, to advise to look carefully at how we do things, because there are many ways to roll out networks. Uh, this is true for indoor, outdoor, fixed or mobile networks, to pick up the best technology, in particular when this technology is European, by the way, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and to move ahead. Um, of course, in a, in a context of competition, we, you, know, we, you will not find a, a truly a uh, private company not liking competition because this is the way to improve what we do.
uh, this, you know, but, but it has to be fair. It has to be fair. And I would advise uh, us as a community not to create artificial barriers that are not needed because we have enough to do in building the right things for us. It's like building the, the roads one or two centuries ago. Uh, it's more important to make it right uh, than to stick to certain principles, especially when these principles are already quite uh, well embedded in how we do things. You know, my 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 view is that there are there are two uh, key principles that have been established as uh, building blocks of Europe, rightly, that have to be considered not as absolute principles, but as something we already have embedded no need to do more on these things and uh, these two principles to me are of course uh, uh, competition we need competition in the private sector as long yeah. as the competition is fair and second is technology neutrality which has been uh, putting uh, uh, in certain places the communities in a situation in which they are investing and they in the end their investment will be three times or five times what it could have been if they would have picked up the right technology from day one. Yeah. I think we have to slightly amend our way of looking at these things if we want to really achieve a change. You know, you cannot change without changing. <laughs> you you have true. to change something. Uh, and, and I think this, this, uh, this would be my plea today. Um, not only because it's favorable to my business, because it's <laughs> easy, but it's not only for that reason. I think it's it's the right way to do things as yeah. an infrastructure for Europe as well. You've spoken about the environmental concerns and also the now the economic concerns of, of rolling out technology too quickly that might not last the test of time. How big a risk do you think that is? And is it happening right now across Europe? Are, are there already investments that have taken place that are unwise in your view? No, certainly I see, I see that already in a few places in the world. I will not mention names to avoid having <coughs> issues with my customers, but uh, I, uh, uh, it's true that when someone goes for uh, local solutions, whatever the situation, it leads to having uh, a weaker performance but we know that everywhere this is the, the economically we know we know what the difference is between buying something cheap you can use immediately because you want to use it immediately or buying something that you that that will get to a higher level with more time it's it's a choice i think um, but here we are talking about an infrastructure that is meant to last 30 years that's the difference you know yeah. it's not a pen that we are buying it's not something you can replace easily and so i think it's important to have that in mind then on the environmental side of things it's the same you know if we use the new technologies in all of these segments by definition, you use something that has been designed with the environment uh, perspective in mind. Yeah. So more recycled materials, uh, less invasive products, uh, consuming less energy. It's all, it's all going into the right direction, also from that perspective. So someone who has built his network 10 years ago, uh, choosing the best technology is, is rather future proof for a while someone who would be building its, his infrastructure now would have to take the best technology of now, which is not the same one as 10 years ago. As long as they are compatible, it is the right thing to do. I think we, we have to dare uh, use our innovation. And we have also, as a complement, uh, an important complement to this, we have to dare use ESG uh, criteria that are the ones we believe in as Europeans. I think, and by the way, for us uh, in Prismian, we clearly put these two things together. Uh, in our industry, ESG and innovation go absolutely well together. They, this, uh, they are the same thing, basically. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I think we have to dare change something and, uh, and add constraints to who is not making the right choices. If not, nothing will change, I'm afraid. I agree. 
I agree. It's, it's an interesting point because I think we do we do need to talk about the future, and I, I'm keen to get a sense from you, uh, both both from a from an ESG perspective, but also from a competition perspective, because you've all mentioned competition, and obviously in the news today we've seen that there's been another foray of private equity into telecoms companies in Europe. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of interest. So I wonder whether you think um, what the landscape you think uh, might might look like in the coming year, whether you think private equity will play a big part in the development of, of telecoms um, and, and what you think will happen next, basically. Um, I'll throw out to Alexandra first, see what you think. Well, uh, it's true that we've been feeling that pressure, but um, I, I do believe that there's one thing which is very uh, important in this upscale of the situation that we're feeling. And uh, we can speak easily in Altice because in France initially, and also in Portugal, we started a little bit of this movement with the separation of the retail companies from the infrastructure companies. Today in Portugal, and I remember back in 2017, 18, when we started, a lot of people said, but I don't understand why you're doing that. You're selling your rings. One of these days you'll be selling your fingers as well. And, and why, are, why are you doing that? And, and the reality is that it became a trend, not because it's fancy, it's because it's the way to go. I do believe that ret retail operators should look at quality of service, at innovation of the services that we provide, at convenience, which is the number one word that we should bring to households and companies, and leave to, to specific and dedicated resources the management of the infrastructures, which, and we were speaking about sustainability, which, by the way, should be mutualized. So yeah. I do believe that the segregation between retail codes and infra codes, it's a way also to contribute to break some barriers and Chinese walls of uh, operators between themselves, not being at ease to reuse other third party infrastructures because they belong to a competitor of theirs. So today with the separation of retail codes and infra codes, what we are looking at both in terms of towers, but also in terms of optical fiber, the, the infra codes are now being more and more attractive to MNOs, even in the cases where uh, relevant equity exists from the existing uh, operators, which is normal because they are spin-offs. Um, but anyway, I do believe that this has created a good momentum for people to understand, like Philippe was saying, that the infrastructure investments are for generations to come. So this is not just a question of me launching an 5G package at X price, which I will change in six months or in nine months. This is different. This is laying down the grounds for our grandsons to use next generation networks. And they will be optical fiber because I would even say that it's not 30. It's probably the next 50 years, optical fiber will be the way for us to connect uh, in terms of physical infrastructures. So I do believe that this is very important. And I believe that this trend, which is uh, scaling up of having uh, infrastructure funds, uh, private equities getting into our business is because they really understand the value of companies that have invested hundreds of millions of euros, if not billions of euros, um, in laying down these, uh, these infrastructures that are very important, not only for commercial use, of course, but also because sometimes when we speak about sustainability, sometimes our head led us to speak about energy consumptions and reduction yeah. and uh, climate changes. But sustainability, according to the nation, to United Nations and, and the, the, the sustainable development objectives, is also about social sustainability. And what I'm, I'm hearing you say, and it's true, that it's very costly and hard for me to get optical fiber to rural areas. We've done it, of course, with a small part of our investment, but we dedicate a small part of our optical fiber investment to take it to very small villages and even simple isolated places in the country. Why? Because we do believe that it's important to close the gap, the digital divide that we were speaking about. Portugal is a country with probably one of the highest penetration rates of optical fiber, but we still have 25% of the population which never use the internet. We still have 35% of our total population that uses a feature phone and not a smartphone. So yeah. it's not just because we lay down infrastructures that people like this become uh, digital intelligent and digitally 
able. So it's important on the sustainability perspective also that we roll out these, in, these, these optical fiber networks, these 4G networks, 5G networks, to make sure that we close this gap of the digital literacy, which is still lagging in some parts of the country. So this is also a commitment and a contribution from, from us to, uh, to become more sustainable, socially sustainable, which is very important. And of course, this um, is something that it's also on the radar of those private equities that we were mentioning about. Yeah. From your perspective, Philippe, is this, does, do you echo this? Do you think this is, a, a, in, in, a, in a sense, a good thing? If, if private equity were to erupt into the <laughs> into the telecoms business, will it will it create better opportunities? As Alexander was saying, potentially potentially better opportunities to to create that that sort of hundred percent coverage. Yeah, uh, for sure, I believe so. And uh, I know I know we are going to be busy for a long time in mm -hmm. doing this. Uh, I very very much agree with Alexander. And I see more and more um, investors being uh, interested in the mid long term, which makes sense when you talk about this sort of infrastructure. So uh, all that makes a lot of sense and it goes very well uh, together with um, the sustainability concern in general. Um, I, I, I believe we have to, uh, about sustainability, we have to do, or you have the choice in my view to do less or to do more with less. And I think in the in the case of telecommunications, there is no option to do less. We all want more, always. So it's about doing more with less. And, and we have to dare change our approach uh, to in particular to technology, in my view, because we we have to dare take the best technologies. Mm -hmm. I think this right. is key and everywhere. And for that, we need the, the right incentives from from the regulators. Mm -hmm. Speaking of regulators, we've got a question here from one of our viewers, and I would very much like to ask Anne Marie this question because I think you will know the answer. So the question is: Will European telecom spin-offs of tower businesses and data centres end up bypassing regulatory constraints on M&A? A very loaded question. I do hope you know the answer. Um, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard. It to is know. hard. It is hard. Um, but um, in my view, our, the, the regulatory constraints on 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 the merger and acquisitions in the European market are are um, very much defined by uh, by by our treaties, um, and it, it is always a question of uh, how much market power you have or will or will acquire um, uh, in one market or another, uh, be it um, uh, telecoms, mobile telecoms, or tower business, the market for towers or the market for data centers. And I do think that throughout Europe, I think given also the uh, the attention that we have been given on on dma and dsa and and getting our head around around the pivotal function um of, of so-called gatekeepers i think we are much more aware now of uh, of the different functions of the uh, internet ecosystem and to make it uh, to be a bit more sensitive sensitized maybe on um uh, on where such gatekeeper positions may arise. So I do think that we're all in, in within Europe and in within the com uh, competition uh, competition authorities and regulatory authorities more aware of the uh, of the risks involved. And we're 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 taking a really close look at at any steps that are taking uh, here. But as I said, the role that we have as regulators are are really the crash barriers. We do not define the speed nor broadly speaking, the direction. It is just that we want to make sure that we do not go over the cliff and, and, and end up in a situation where uh, the US Congressman has just said uh, one, one has to restore competition because nothing is so uh, difficult as restoring competition once, once you've lost it. This is yeah. basically what, the, what they are facing uh, across the Atlantic. Um, uh, but so here we are trying to be to make sure that um, any developments in the in business in, in markets is is what that's what the markets are there for. But we still have to be very cautious of um, uh, of, of keeping within the, the crash barriers, be it in direct connectivity or in tower businesses or data centers. Okay, I've got time for one last question. There's about thirty seconds, Philippe. I'm looking at you. <laughs> All right. With the need constantly to update networks, how can telecoms be sustainable 
and capital efficient. You've got 30 seconds, go. All right, to me, it's a matter of not doing things twice. So go, for, go immediately for the right thing. It might take a couple of years more, but you will get where you need to be. Brilliant, succinct, to the point. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, that's fabulous. I think this is almost time now. So that's unfortunately all we have time for today. Thank you so much to all of the speakers in this session. You have been fantastic. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.